My name is Jim Lee. It is January 15th, 2015, and we're here on climateviewer.com slash harp on the harp page. And we're going to do another harp um, update. So uh, let's talk about what the main purpose of harp is. Above all else, what is the single most important thing you need to know about harp? They're trying to destroy the Van Allen belts. I know that sounds crazy. It sounds absolutely phenomenally crazy. It is 100% true, and I'm going to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Watch this. So if you scroll down on the heart page, you're going to see that we have a research timeline of uh, space weather modification, so you can get up to speed on all this. And over on the sidebar is a table of contents with a bunch of articles about heart. We're going to focus on radiation belt remediation today. Now... This right here is called the Tether Panel Recommendation. Use HARP facility in Alaska as a wind tunnel to determine the feasibility and engineering specifications of a mitigation system. Mitigation system for what? For killer electrons in our ionosphere. Now, there are several different radiation belts around the planet. They're called the Van Allen belts. And um, these things fry satellites. And they really don't like their little satellites fried. So they have been um, basically, you know, trying to suck the electrons out of the sky by pumping uh, electromagnetic missiles, um, EMIC waves, uh, Shear Allen, Shear Alvin waves, uh, magnetosonic waves. These are very low frequency, ultra low frequency, ELF frequency, um, you know, uh, vibrations <laughs> that are pushing electrons out of the sky. When they push them out of the sky, they come down and they form artificial aurora. The aurora borealis is the natural form of this. Electrons race in from the, <clears throat> from outer space and uh, they form the aurora borealis and australis and that is natural. But what we are doing now with these ionospheric heaters is using electromagnetic radiation from high-powered microwaves to push that radiation out of the ionosphere. This paper, that, that picture you just saw there, comes from a satellite threat due to high-altitude nuclear detonation at the Eisenhower Institute. And uh, Mr. Papadopoulos is giving the presentation. And as you see through here, Dennis Papadopoulos, University of Maryland. You want to know about heart? Read about this guy. Anything he posts, it's liquid gold. Um, and then you, you scroll through here, and what you're seeing here is um, they were basically trying to say that, you know, upper atmospheric electromagnetic pulse, the stuff you saw on the TV show Revolution, when they took out all the power, if you were to explode a nuclear detonation above the planet, the electromagnetic radiation, the EMP, pulse would come down and take out all the power. So that's a concern. Um, the Heritage Foundation said that two-thirds of Americans would die within six months if we lost our power. So yeah, uh, it's much worse than the TV show Revolution. And their solution was to possibly use um, these, these ionospheric heaters to suck that radiation out. So if somebody were to set off a nuke in the sky that hopefully they could turn on the ionospheric heaters and suck it out. This is how they're they're trying to sell this to the military and to the um to the the government. So what they've done is Microsoft was set up so that there would be one global operating system that the U.S. government had a backdoor into for all computers everywhere in the world. 
Right. Then they set up Google as a search engine. And let's just look at the background of the two guys who supposedly set it up. Larry Page One, and Sergey Brin. That's right. Now, Sergey Brin is a, he was born in Russia, so he's from an immigrant family. But listen to this. His father was a mathematician who worked at the University of Maryland, and his mother worked for NASA. I didn't know that one. That's, that's well, it's just, it's like a blue line. NASA, and yeah. that is exactly where Sergey Brin and Larry Page park their private jets. Of course. It's at the NASA facility. Mm-hmm. They don't have to go through TSA. Gosh, what a surprise. Right. Larry Page is an American. His parents were both computer science professors at Michigan State University, and his father was one of the top experts in the United States on artificial intelligence. Now, Sergey Brin married a Polish-American woman called Anne Wojcicki. So as soon as Anne Wojcicki married Sergey Brin, she was given millions of dollars in venture capital the day she, of she the got wedding. A, yeah, the, I think she got $20 million. Just to start. Right. That's right. All right, hold on. Loren Moray is our guest tonight, a longtime friend of good people everywhere on the planet. Her work in depleted uranium, of course, really knows uh, no bounds and needs not much of an introduction. She's talked about it too many times to count around the world and on this program as well. We're talking about Google and DNA and control. Next time you hit the Google search function, just keep in mind that your finger is doing a lot more than simply looking up information. You're helping to propel a monster on the planet. It is a beast. It's yes. unbelievable what's going on. Go ahead. It's, un it's yeah. unbelievable. And what I want to emphasize is that Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and the social networking websites, All of them. All of them. eBay, Skype, Google Mail, Yahoo Mail, PayPal, these are all the same entity. They're all integrated. They get bought and sold and traded around. These are all U.S. Navy and military operations. Now, I know a physicist who told me that they were tracking people in the lab by the electromagnetic frequency emitted by individual's DNA. In other words, every living thing is an antenna that transmits and receives. We're on an electrical system, and the DNA in every living thing has a unique frequency and signal. That is what they're using, what they're focusing on, and what they're weaponizing to completely control us. The DNA Human Genome Project was carried out at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where I was a staff scientist for five years. But the Lawrence Livermore Lab, Los Alamos National Lab, these are all nuclear weapons labs, were also involved. That means the military because the nuclear weapons labs exist for the Pentagon and the Pentagon exists for the oil companies. So the Human Genome Project was set up and well-funded to experiment and to research and to describe the human genome. Now, how would they use that? Well, what we know about Google is that they are doing DNA surveys from space. This would be NASA and the Navy. NASA is run by the Navy. They have been tracking and identifying isolated populations, for instance, in the Amazon, who have never had contact with uh, Western people. These are villages of isolated people who are still living their traditional 
hunter gatherer lives right and they've they've never seen a westerner um that's just that's not just humans they are also doing a global species survey and i've been tracking this for 2 years and noticed that many new species are being discovered uh and it seems to be on a grid system so they're doing a survey from space and they went down uh, the west coast of South America and then came up the east coast, and now they're in Southeast Asia. And if you watch in the news, about once a week they come up with a new article and photos on new species they've discovered. This is part of the United Nations Agenda 21 program, which is to identify all species and to do a complete global inventory of humans and animals. And what David Rockefeller has said about Agenda 21 is that in the end, we're going to have a chip on every person, and they will only be allowed to take out of the system what they put into it. If you work 12 hours a day, you're allowed to take 12 hours of something of value out of the system, but nothing more. Hmm. What is going on? The J. Greg Venter Institute, which mm-hmm. you sent me the article, right. um, has their mission as, uh, quote, to forge new life forms, unquote. And they are also involved in manipulated computer code on DNA. What does this mean? Well, Dr. Helen Wallace from Gene Watch in 2002 said we are in great danger, and she described this as a massive DNA database by the back door. Now, what this does sociologically, it begins to set up a caste system here, which we already have, but this is a different way of doing it. I don't know where it's all going to go, but it's it's clearly hurtling forward at a pace that is pretty damn scary, if you understand the potential of control here. And what they're doing is using computing, medicine, technology, and the police state to converge into basically what is creating a totalitarian scientific oligarchy. And their purpose is to get this information and use it in discriminatory programs where the rich benefit and the poor are impacted negatively by these programs. And the second part of that agenda is the depopulation initiatives. Now, a really good example about this biopiracy. Now, I did an interview with Dr. Wynne Parker. So on the air, I was talking about depleted uranium and the tremendous affinity it has for the DNA and mitochondria because uranium and phosphate structures, they have a love affair all through the universe. And that means that when people are exposed to uranium particles from these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yugoslavia, and by the way, it's over here in two weeks, uh, in the U.S., and, and we're inhaling it. Sure, all the time. It, it sticks to our DNA and our mitochondria that provide all the energy for the body. Somebody made the decision to go ahead and use it against the people in Yugoslavia and then Iraq, knowing full well what would happen. And that's a party I would like to see brought to justice, whoever that was. So as I was sitting there describing all of this to Dr. Parker, and I was talking about HARP, this is all all integrated into the HARP system, Um, I knew that Dr. Parker, when Parker was not his real name, I knew he was a CIA scientist. I knew he'd worked for the U.S. government, for the Department of Defense, for the World Health Organization, and the U.N. at different times, and I knew that He was a microbiologist who knew the whole field because he had to advise the government. And so I just 
said, Dr. Parker, what is the application of this discovery Uh that nanoparticles are transmitters? And he caught his breath, and he said, well, it's to redesign the human genome. That's all, huh? (laughs) That's all. They're going to create a new species is what they're talking about here. It's to create anything they want to. It's to repeat anything they want to. It's this totalitarian, insane scientific oligarchy that's run by psychopaths, and they think they can do anything they want to. Well, it's so now, far nobody's around to stop them, unfortunately. Now, what is transmitting and receiving that's around us? Well, how about cell phones mm-hmm. in the megahertz frequency band? These are some abstracts that I'm going to just read the titles of. Uh, this is 1996. Single and double-strand DNA breaks in rat brain cells after acute exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic radiation, Mm -hmm. and they use the cell phone frequencies. DNA strand breaks in rat brain cells. So they're talking about sterility, about cancer, and about altering people's behavior. And the airport scanners are doing the same thing. Wouldn't surprise me. I'm amazed that there's very little attention being paid to the electric grid. And as all of you listening know, it is surrounding you and everybody you know 24 hours a day. Your home, your office, it doesn't matter. It's it's called wiring in your walls. And that 60 hertz electric service that you rely on to power your goodies can also be used to carry any kind of telecommunication business you can imagine, and I would submit mind and behavior altering and control platforms as well. It's all doable. It's very simple to do because we are electrical systems and we transmit and receive just like any other antenna. We're electrical first and chemical second. We are electric beings. That's right. And a lot of this was described in the 1930s in the lectures that Bertrand Russell gave at Oxford University. And I would like to read a paragraph, if that's okay. Yeah, we have uh, three minutes, so you have to hurry. Okay. A totalitarian government with a scientific bent might do things that to us would seem horrifying. The Nazis were more scientific than the present rulers of Russia and were more inclined to the atrocities that I have in mind. If they had survived, they would probably have soon taken to scientific breeding. Any nation which adopts this practice will, within a generation, secure great military advantages. The system, one may surmise, will be something like this, except possibly in the governing aristocracy. All but 5% of males and 30% of females will be sterilized. The 30% of females will be expected to spend the years from 18 to 40 in reproduction in order to secure adequate cannon fodder. As a rule, artificial insemination will be preferred to the natural method. The unsterilized, if they desire the pleasures of love, will usually have to seek them with sterilized partners. In other words, Jeff, Bertrand Russell's message Mm -hmm. is that wild reproduction is no longer an option. Yeah. So basically, they have unlimited budgets. They have an unlimited scientific body in universities to do all this research. And today, over 50% of scientific research money in universities comes from the Pentagon. 